Let's talk about mineralogy and the different carbonate minerals that can exist. We've seen from the chemistry that we obtain a carbonate ion from atmospheric CO2 dissolved in seawater. To obtain a carbonate mineral, you need to associate that carbonate ion with a metal. That ternary diagram shows that there are three main metals that can form carbonates. At the top of the diagram, we see that we have calcium which is probably the most common metal in the ocean that associate with carbonates. We also have magnesium here on the lower left corner, and we have iron. These three metals form most of the carbonate minerals that we know. Let's start by looking at calcium. What happens when you associate calcium with a carbonate ion? You obtain a calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonates that we have, the most common ones, are aragonite, which is probably the most common mineral in the ocean, calcite, and vaterite. Vaterite is a hydrated uh, mineral, and it's not a stable phase, so you will never find it in the geological record. Aragonite, however, you can find, although it is not very stable. We'll talk about this in diagenesis. And calcite is extremely abundant and extremely frequent in limestones. You also find in the ocean a mineral known as high magnesium calcite or high mag calcite. It's effectively a calcite with about 5% of magnesium substitution in its structure. That means 5% or less of the calcium have been substituted for magnesium. Here's a beautiful example of a calcite, a birefringent calcite mineral. And by contrast, this is an aragonite mineral, and you can see beautiful aragonitic needles. Aragonite tends to form those beautiful needles. So what happens when you have a mineral that is a carbonate with a magnesium, so a purely magnesium carbonate. It's known as magnesite, and that's what we have in the cliffs behind us. It's a magnesite, so a high magnesium um, rich carbonate. Magnesite is always diagenetic. You don't typically find magnesite as a precipitate in the ocean, and so it is interesting from a diagenetic uh, point of view but it's not a very common mineral in the ocean. Now, what happens when you have an iron-rich mineral? This is known as a siderite. And siderite, again, is not common in the ocean. However, it is a mineral that can be quite common in lateritic soils, where you have a lot of uh, uh, weathering of, of minerals. So you tend to have those siderite and bauxite, etc. There's another very important mineral here. It's one where you have substitution of calcium by magnesium, but unlike the high mag calcite that we talked about, you have a more, most perfect substitution, 50-50 substitution of the, two, uh, of the two metals. That is known as a dolomite. So dolomite are very common in the rock record, but they are not very common in sediments. They're, it is a, an extremely important mineral for reservoirs. And this is a beautiful example of a stromatoporite. This is an organism similar to corals, but much older, that was dolomitized. And that's why you have this beautiful red color. Beware, though, that dolomites are not always red. In fact, one thing that can happen is you can substitute some of the magnesium of the dolomite for a, an iron um, mineral, for an iron ion, and that gives you a family of iron-rich dolomite known as anchorite. So anchorite, again, pretty common as a diagenetic mineral, but not really common as a precipitate in the ocean. However, I insist that dolomites are very important in terms of rock volume and in terms of reservoir properties. So now that we know what minerals we can expect in the ocean, let's talk about the preservation and the formation of different minerals in the ocean. And this is very relevant for understanding the biology and the diagenesis or chemistry of carbonates. So on this slide here, I'm showing you a vertical graph 
of the ocean. So it starts at zero meter on the vertical axis down to 5,000 meters or five kilometers below the surface of the waves. And on the left, you see a zone of temperature. So you have the different temperatures that you can encounter in the ocean. In the middle, you have the percentage of carbonate um, in the sediments. So that means the carbonate preserved in the sediments at the bottom of the water column. And on the right, we have the different zone or diagenetic zones um, in the ocean. So if we look at uh, the, the first column, so we, lo if we look at the temperature, you can see that red line shows basically that we start at the surface of the ocean if we're in tropical waters, the temperature will be very high, in the high 20s, maybe close to 30 degrees. And as you go down in the water, maybe a few tens of meters, you see that the temperature can, can be maintained for a little while, but then it starts to decline. So the temperature of the water is changing. We're getting towards much colder temperature, and already at one kilometer, we are below 10 degrees. And then the structure of the ocean is relatively homogeneous below one kilometer. We have you know, eight degrees, six degrees Celsius, maybe five degrees at the very bottom of the water column in, in the deep ocean. That rapid decline in temperature is known as the thermocline. So we have uh, the ter thermocline uh, shown here. And above the thermocline, we have a mixing zone where the waters are mixed by storm and waves. Now, the fact that the temperature is changing in the ocean has tremendous implication for the preservation of different carbonates because not every carbonate mineral is preserved the same way throughout the water column. So if you look in the middle, uh, in the middle column, that uh, becomes obvious because you can see that aragonite, which is shown in green, is very abundant in the top, maybe five, six, seven hundred meters of the water column in the zone that is really warm before we reach the thermocline. But then within the thermocline, as temperature decrease, the aragonite stability is no longer reached, which means that aragonite starts to dissolve. The dissolution of aragonite liberates carbonate iron, which means that we can have secondary calcite formation, so more calcite cement form. So aragonite dissolves relatively quickly, and it reaches a point known as the aragonite compensation depth, where effectively none of the aragonite is preserved in the sediments. And that's suggest suggested here to be anywhere between one and two kilometer. It depends um, from basin to basin. It's not a constant. Calcite is more resistant to this type of dissolution. So calcite will be preserved for a few kilometer, but at some point, calcite will also start to decrease. Now that inflection point where calcites start to decrease is known as the lysocline. And one thing I've not mentioned is if you look at the aragonite, we also have an aragonite lysocline where uh, aragonite preservation starts to decrease. After the calcite lysocline, around three kilometers, we have a rapid decrease of the amount of calcite that is preserved in the ocean and eventually we reach the point known as the calcite compensation depth, or CCD, below which none of the sediments contain any carbonates. This is why if you go into the deep ocean, the deep Pacific Ocean, below 4.5 kilometers of water, you do not have any carbonates. It's essentially just very um, red mud that are clastic mud that are essentially wind-borne or wind-blown sediments, but no carbonates. So why are carbonates not preserved? It's because their stability depends on pressure and temperature. And the higher the temperature, the easier it is to precipitate a carbonate, whether it's calcite or aragonite. The higher the temperature, the easier it is to precipitate the carbonates. But the lower the temperature of the water, the easier it is to dissolve the carbonate. And that's why we see this behavior. That means that we can now separate the ocean column into multiple zones. So we can have zone one, which is a zone of precipitation. And then we can have zone two, which is a zone of dissolution and precipitation. Dissolution because aragonite is being dissolved, but precipitation because the 
carbonate ions that are that are coming out of this dissolution can be then precipitated as a calcite because we're still in a zone of the of the ocean where calcite is um, super saturated. And then zone three is a zone of net dissolution. Aragonite is completely dissolved and calcite starts to dissolve. And finally, zone four is the zone of no carbonates. It's below the CCD and no carbonates can be preserved. What we see here vertically in the ocean is paralleled also if you look laterally throughout different latitudes. So if you are in a tropical zone, which is more or less the example I showed you before, we have nicely the, the three zones, zone one, zone two, zone three, and zone four. But if you move towards higher latitude, you can see that zone one is start, starting to taper down. There is less and less of that zone one where aragonite can be easily precipitated. And in fact, above 35 degrees, it disappears, 35 degrees north or south in terms of latitude. So this is important and it explains why corals, we will see this in the next class, cannot grow at high latitude because they have an aragonite skeleton. It's very hard to precipitate that above 35 degrees uh, north or south of latitude. And you can see that then above this, zone two becomes the zone at the surface. That's a zone where aragonite is effectively dissolved, but calcite can be precipitated. And of course, zone three and four are shallower. So what can we conclude and summarize on this class? Well, the first thing is we've seen that CO2 is linked to carbonates. That has important implications when we will talk about, for instance, carbon and oxygen isotopes. And we also now understand where the carbonate ion is coming from. We've also seen that supersaturation in calcium carbonate leads to precipitation. This is an important concept, both supersaturation and undersaturation that we will use later in the class. We've seen in that respect that pH has an important control on the chemical precipitation of carbonates. We've also seen that temperature controls whether or not it's easy to precipitate different types of minerals or, in contrary, to dissolve them. And we've seen that there are multiple carbonate minerals and that carbonate minerals are effectively the association of a carbonate ion and one or several metals in the structure of the mineral. Okay, that's it for this class. In the next one, we will start to introduce the notion of carbonate factory and look at the important role that biology plays in precipitation of calcium carbonate. Wow.